Therapy by Nayira Waid. The hard season will split you through. Do not worry. You will bleed water. Do not worry. This is grief. Your face will fall out and down your skin and there will be scorching. But do not worry. Keep speaking the years from their hiding places. Keep coughing up smoke from all the deaths you have died. Keep the rage tender because the soft season will come. It will come loud, ready, gulping, both hands in your chest, up all night, up all of the nights to drink all damage into love. It's good to be with all of you this morning. As many of you know, I'm in my third year of seminary at Andover Newton. This semester, two of my primary courses are forgiveness and grief. And I keep asking myself whose genius idea that was. It was mine. <laughs> so halfway through the semester now, I should have this halfway figured out. But that's the thing with ministry, though. I don't have anything figured out any more than all of you. I think that you ask me to notice and to reflect, to hold up a mirror of those things that we already know together. We know how important it is to honor and to bless our beloved dead like we did today. And in the book of Hebrews chapter 12 verse 1, it says, therefore, we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. Let us also lay aside every weight and the sin that clings so closely. And let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us. Now, don't worry, that's all the Bible I'll give you. And <laughs> remembering together helps us to lay aside the weight Blessed, the prayer we said today, blessed are the stories told with tears and loud, loud, loud laughter. Remembering together gives us that perseverance for this race set before us, this race that is our life. We carry our losses and griefs together, grief for which we have photographs or stones but also the ambiguous, the disenfranchised, the unspoken griefs that have no photos. The children never born, babies never conceived, loved ones still alive but taken from us by dementia, loved ones still alive but from whom we have to distance ourselves for our emotional safety, and other losses, losses of jobs and relationships and dreams, of health or physical function to pursue our vocations, loss of the chance for forgiveness or for speaking what has been unspoken. Loss of feeling safe in the world, loss for hope sometimes, and sometimes a loss of ourselves. Because we're all dying, certainly, but we're all also being reborn. I read every single cell in our body regenerates. Have you heard this? Every seven years, it said, we're a completely new being. Everything about us is different, down to our cells. I think that's amazing. And this helps me to make sense of the ways that death and loss change us. Grief changes us down to ourselves, and we find ourselves faced 
with four tasks of mourning, which are really four questions. How do we help one another actualize loss? How do we help one another process the pain of grief? How do we help one another make external adjustments, internal adjustments, spiritual adjustments to the world holding our loss? And how can we help one another find enduring connection with what we've lost? And I think all of these questions have the same answer. We answer these four tasks together. Together on days like today with All Souls, our ritual, we share openly about our losses, big and small. We let go of that pressure to clean up well, to appear to have it all together. We trust that expressing our complicated suffering doesn't mean that we lack faith or perspective or hope. I took a class last year called Spiritual Autobiography, and we were required to read a number of memoirs, spiritual memoirs. And a couple of my classmates commented on the choices that I selected, that they seemed a little depressing and heart-wrenching. <laughs> and one of my classmates asked, don't you want to read something a little more uplifting? How can you stomach reading such uncomfortable and painful stories? And what I wanted to explain to my classmate was that I needed to read those. I needed to know how the authors of those stories lived on from tragedy or violence or what they considered in the beginning of their journey to be unspeakable losses. Have any of you felt this way? This need to know how somebody else did it. Because all of us here, we all know how to survive. We all know how to keep putting one foot in front of the other, to keep doing the next right thing. But that's not always enough, is it? I want you to know that your story matters. Your experience matters. Your life, your memoir matters. And when you share your weakest moments in a community that loves you, you give all of us a gift. And from that gift, we learn and grow and transform. And not only do we receive the gift of loving and accompanying you, we gather data and choices and options for those times we know are coming ahead for all of us, what to do when we don't know what to do. That vulnerability blesses all of us. It helps us to face and actualize our losses together. And the rest of these tasks of mourning flow together. The second one is processing the pain of grief. Rabbi Stephen Roberts says that every grieving person needs to tell their story 150 times before they can begin to heal. 150 times. And next thing he says is our friends and family might feel burned out after the first 50. That's real, right? <laughs> and that's why we need community and we need rituals like we have today. Spaces for lament. We need to come together and lay down our stones because our stones are easier to carry together. When we speak, when we write something that's inside of us, its weight begins to live outside of us. We heard a poem from Nayira Wahid, and she has a shorter one called Heal. It says, we all break. It is OK to hold your heart outside of your body for days, months, years at a time. We all break. And grief, it doesn't follow a timetable or orderly stages. There are waves and cycles. And old grief takes us by surprise. In the poem just read, our face falls out and down our skin. We bleed water. But when we make space as a community for all the losses we experience, we deepen our ability to hold the complexity and the fullness of life. 
we lament together. This lamenting is an ancient practice and it, it's not something that we do alone, it's communal. It's essential to our healing. John Swinton has a book called Raging with Compassion. A lament, John says, is a repeated cry of pain, rage, sorrow, and grief that emerges in the midst of suffering and alienation. Lament is prayer. It is, however, a very particular form of prayer that's not content with soothing platitudes or images of a God who will only listen to voices that appease and compliment. Lament takes the brokenness of human experience into the heart of God and it demands that God answer. Now, however we name God, we can name these messy, scorching feelings and we let go of knowing. We make room for the unknown. We rest together in mystery and not having answers. We choose instead to be the answer for one another, to be love and comfort in the midst of confusion, confusion and despair. We draw new maps for each other, for those other tasks, those last two tasks of mourning, which are adjusting to the world without who or what we've lost and finding an enduring or new relationship to what we've lost, to ourselves, and to the world. A year of Wahid said, your soul stained my shoulders. My whole life smells like you. This will take time to undo you from my blood. This is the work. This poem of Nayira Wahid's, I just love the, how she speaks with such raw, real words. She said, this work, we could say that this work could never be done, that we continue to try to make meaning for the rest of our lives, but we make that meaning together. We connect to our beloved clouds of witnesses in maybe new and surprising ways. They live on our losses, our beloved dead. In us, they live on in the love that we share with others. They live on in the world around us. One of the things that we do, we did today, we speak their names. We speak the names of our losses, lar large and small. One of my witnesses is a little boy named Bram Venn. And he died five years ago this month when he was just two years old. And every year, his parents, Sammy and TJ, they ask the world to do something special in Bram's honor. They say, go out and do something to love fearlessly, like our son Bram loved fearlessly. I hope we can all take that beautiful charge out with us into the world to go out and love fearlessly. I want to ask us to keep speaking the names of our beloved witnesses, not just once a year at the end of October or beginning of November, but every chance that we get. And let's also keep naming the other quieter, maybe smaller losses for one another. Let's not be afraid to remind one another of loss. It doesn't leave us. We carry our stones together. Let us let these stories live on in our many clouds of witnesses. Our shared stories give us life. Our cloud of witnesses loves us. May we rest in the wonder and the mystery together. Amen.